Hello and welcome to the Moncast. As always, I'm Stevie, and this episode I'm joined by Chisai236. Hi. The current score is 12-7 to Pokemon, and this time we'll be discussing the 20th episodes, The Darkness Before Dawn, and Chikorita's Big Upset. Let's start with The Darkness Before Dawn. Most of the recap was a recap. The only bit about it that was noticeable for me was TK said Camaramon in a really weird way. Yeah, he did. It's like, Kim- what was it? Camaramon or something like that? No, the Camara bit was fine. It was just he went like Camaramon. And after that, we get the actual episode, which is the main bit we all care about. And since last time... Camaramon's just gone in a straight line, destroying everything it comes across, and the Digimon Emperor is following behind. He basically went off the deep end right here. I mean, technically he went off the deep end yesterday, because that was when the Whirlpool thing was involved, but you know. But today he's gone further off the deep end. All this destruction is happening, and the Zero Two kids are just following behind, just being like, what do we do? We're weak. We cannot do anything. We need to do something. Plan! Go! Plan, go, we need to do a plan, just because this is really bad. Just like Cody says how bad it is, and then Yoli says for some reason, watch your mouth. All Cody said was like, we need to stop him or something. It's like, what? Why? It's not like he said something bad. No, Cody was like, he's burning the whole digital world or something. And Yoli disapproves of the word burning. I guess, yeah. It was a weird line. Yeah, it was an odd line. It was mainly there for the follow-up joke from Tentamon about it tasting bad. Yeah. Wait, does Tentamon even have a tongue? No, he doesn't have a mouth at all, I don't think. No, it, like, it opens sideways or something. Does it? It's never been shown to open, has it? I assume he eats somehow, and that's how beetle mouths work, I think. This. I'm trying to display it with my hands and it doesn't work because this is audio. <laughs> no, 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 please, please show me how the, the mouth things work. I'm showing my hands like this, and the fingers are interlocking, and they open sideways like that. Like like what I'm doing right now. Right. It's horizontal instead of vertical, basically. And they, they just sort of interlock the, the square bits, and that's how he opens the mouth to eat. The question I have is, does he have a tongue behind that bit? Uh, probably not. I don't think bugs have tongues. Then can he taste? But then again, Kabuterimon and Mega Kabuterimon have tongues. And so is Hercules, Cavaturian. Maybe he does have a tongue, I don't know. I don't know. So they come up with this brilliant idea, which is point this pipeline out to Izzy, who can come up with a brilliant idea. Like, it makes it look like Cody had an idea, but Cody basically just sees the pipe in the desert and is like, huh, I have an idea. I'll tell Izzy, and then Izzy can figure something out. Just like he got halfway to being impressive and then just gave all the credit to Izzy. Yeah, I was just like, hey, Izzy, there's a pipe here. Does that mean anything? And then Izzy's like, oh, it's oil. We can use fire. But Cody basically just lost all credit he could have had there. Also, I'm pretty certain, was the Digimon Emperor's base flying away from the kids? I think it was flying towards them. But then how did they get so far ahead? Because Cameramon's moving pretty quickly. It's weird, like, logic. Listen, they got on the ship. Let's just be happy they got on the ship eventually. (laughs) Yeah, eventually. So yeah, Ty, Matt, and Izzy are in the campgrounds, and they just get their Digimon in the digital world to burst the pipe and lay on fire. So that stops the ship because it's on fire, and that needs to be dealt with. Even though it's mostly made of stone. But stone on fire isn't good. But stone can't catch fire. It can in the digital world. Okay, sure. I guess I don't know how the digital world functions. A burning stone needs to stop for repairs. That well-known saying. So while the ship is stopped, all of the Zero Two kids enter through another convenient entrance. Super convenient. During all this opening bit, we get quite a few shots of Ken. Oh, sorry, the Digimon Emperor. Just sort of going do lally in the middle of the ship. Because the darkness is getting to his head. He's hearing the voice of darkness. Which is Devimon, even though it shouldn't really be Devimon. I don't know. Devimon was the dark bit that he took from the dark pool, which isn't in the dark ocean. It was just a regular ocean. Yeah, I'm just thinking of, like, other things that happen later. 
Like, they could have tied this kind of stuff in a little better, but they didn't. They threw Devimon in for some weird reason. I think it's just a general power of darkness. But it's definitely Devimon's voice. I recognize it from last episode. Just a weird one to get back. Just like, they could have picked any of the last series villains, so Apocalyman would have probably made more sense for sort of a darkness that's been dispersed. Anything would have worked. It's just they're not consistent with it. They've already thrown in the Dark Ocean bit. Now they have Devimon, and there's other stuff that gets thrown in later. It's just like, where are we going with this exactly? Yeah, it's, it's kind of just Ken's losing the plot. He's hearing voices, he's having nightmares when he's awake. It's all getting to him. Some stellar voice acting work, I think. The performance is really good on Ken's part. It's not too bad. I definitely got the impression he was going crazy and was very evil, which was definitely the goal. This episode is interesting because he goes from like, like he's officially lost it to he kind of comes back a little later on. I should wait till we get to that, but there's good range in this episode for Ken. He does go sort of back and forth. So, the Digi kids get into the Digi base through the Digi doorway that was Digi there. The Digi doorway that was Digi there. Ken just clearly has this thing for wide open doorways into a secret base. I kind of forget now. Is that the same doorway they used last time? I think it's a different one because it has a ledge outside. It's the second convenient doorway. But then there's multiple just like convenient entrances into his base. I mean, who needs security anyway when you've got a chimera man? Ken, apparently. They just walk in there. (laughs) They really do. They just follow this tunnel through and end up in this like Death Star landing bay, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Just lots of metal and flat surfaces and woo, it's sci-fi. Davis even makes a joke about it being very sci-fi-like. And there's something about him saving Kari and Kari calling it a fantasy. Right, yeah. Did you know that Davis likes Kari? No, I had no idea. He constantly, constantly talks about saving Kari like a damsel in distress. I had no idea he liked Kari. Once they're all inside, Ken's guard Chimeramon turns up to protect the base. He protect, but he attack, but he mainly... Fires his laser. Yes, he fires his laser a lot. He's also very, very big. Every shot he's in, he's like, I don't know, 20 times taller than all the Digimon. He's big. He's big, yeah. He's a big abomination against nature. (laughs) Can you call the digital world natural? Against digital nature? They're living creatures, so they have a natural order kind of thing. Is the digital world a real world? Yes, they are currently in it. But is it real? If the other world's the real world... That implies that the digital world isn't real. Well, it's digital, and humans control everything, so of course they're going to call their world the real world. I'm just trying to get philosophical, but don't have any answers. No counters to that. We're assuming that the digital world is a quote-unquote real world. Well, in the context of this, it is. It's as real as the real world is real. I should have studied philosophy, because it makes no sense, just like this show. So, the Digikids get the Digimon to fight Chimeramon, and... It does diddly squat. It goes about as well as you'd expect. A bunch of armor trying to take on a giant mega. Doesn't touch him. They even do the big combined power of friendship strike and it doesn't even scratch him. It didn't do nothing. Not even a scuff. Nothing. Not a scratch. Not a scuff. Not a bruise. Nothing. It's just like, eh, I'm a firing my laser. And then Kamara just does that several times. Over and over and just decimates them. Flame Drummond, Hossamon, and Digmon all go back to the Digi Baby forms, and Patamon and Gatamon are back to Patamon and Gatamon. So many names. And Ken's watching all this through his live feed of everything that he has. And this this really standout moment for me in the episode where Ken just twigs for a second that Digimon might be alive. Ken's like thinking like, oh, they're so small now. And then Warmon's like, yeah, they're just like human babies. And then Ken kind of has a moment of like, oh... I didn't think about it like that. He ends up ordering Chimeramon to stop, which is like, oh, he has a sense of mercy. Okay, that's kind of neat. He's not completely a terrible person. He's just not really, he doesn't consider them like living. But then when he kind of thinks like, oh, they're like babies, he's kind of like, uh, I'll just take care of this on my own. Because it's kind of like he's uncomfortable with it, sort of. Like, I don't want to attack defenseless babies. So he orders Chimera to stop and just goes down there to basically talk to the kids himself. I didn't really think about it up to this point, but Ken's just kind of looked at the Digimon as playthings. 
things for him to control and mess around with and dominate. Yeah, that's one of the things I really like about the Emperor is it's just like, it's just a game to him. and He doesn't realize that they're actually alive. And then that's kind of the error of his ways is that they're living things and you're doing all this to living things. Because if you're playing like a video game and you do stuff like Ken's doing it, it doesn't matter because it's a video game. So it's kind of interesting to watch Ken kind of realize like, oh no, they're alive. Oh, they might be? They might be. Well, yeah. He sort of has just this twinge of empathy for them. It's almost like sort of a little switch flicked in his head for a second. It's just like, maybe there's more to this than I was thinking about. A really standout moment. Just like a villain going, wait a second, I could be wrong. You don't see that much. So it stood out in the episode as an important moment. So at this point, Chimeramon's on standby, literally. So this gives the DigiKids some time to plan the next step. By that I mean, Davis just says, we need to do something. I'm not just going to stop because you're all tired and runs ahead. Which, honestly, I appreciate. I think that was the right move to make because he was up for the challenge and no one else was. You don't often have a moment just where the big bad monsters literally just stood there doing nothing so you can walk past him. So it's just like, we need to do something while we can, so let's go. So he makes his way to the engine room. Everyone else tries to follow after him, but they get intercepted by Cameramon, who's been woken up again by Ken. Sorry, the Digimon Emperor. But when Ken tries to give Chimeramon an order, Chimeramon just leaves. He's like, I'm out, and just flies away. He's out enough. And then Ken has a breakdown. Ken has a breakdown. He's hearing the voices again. TK makes a mention of it, though, so I don't know if everyone can hear it, or maybe just TK and Ken can hear it, but TK does mention, like, do you hear that voice? Yeah, like, I didn't register that TK hears the weird voice as well. I don't think anyone else reacted to it, so it may just be TK that can hear it. I guess it's just a link to Devimon that they have. Just kind of reinforcing that mirrored link they have from the last episode and how much it bothered him and everything. Like, TK overcame that darkness. Yeah, TK is basically anti-darkness, despite the fact that his crest isn't light. I mean, if Kari had been around, she probably would have been the one to finish off Devimon, but she wasn't yet. Yeah, like, just TK's already like had that phase of battling the darkness and overcoming it, whereas Ken is embracing it and trying to harness its power. Yeah, and it's just overwhelming him, which... Yeah, he's having a breakdown now. A sweet little thing, though, is poor poor Wormmon is trying so hard to, like, help Ken, and Ken's just, like, losing his mind. And so Wormmon's like, all right, I'm going to do something about this. And so basically as Davis is running towards the engine room, Wormmon comes up and is like, it's over here. I'll show you. He's funny because cause Davis says, you're helping us? Do I look stupid to you? And he's like, uh, never mind. And Wormon, Wormon's just like really sweet and is, is like, no, I'm trying to help Ken. I'm trying to help my master and I'll cooperate with you if that means he'll get better. And so he leads Davis to the engine room. Top 10 anime betrayals. Well, it's not really a betrayal. He's helping the good guys, and Ken's a bad guy, so it's kind of a betrayal. That's fair. It's in Ken's interests, but it's not what Ken would want. That's that's true. So, I put it as number five on my anime betrayals. It's a betrayal for good. The best interest betrayal. Yeah. So, this leads to the engine room, which is powered by a digi-egg that's covered in darkness. Davis says, we have to pick it up, and then it just picks itself up. How are we going to pick it up? And it just starts floating... So it it lifts up, it sheds the darkness, explodes with golden radiance, whatever the prophecy was, blows up the engine room or something, so the ship just stops in midair. Well, the DGA is the power source, so all the power goes out. So the lights shut off and everything. Yeah, and the ship just stops moving. So I guess it has something else powering it, otherwise it should crash. Yeah, it's just kind of not moving anymore. Then this Digi-Egg, this golden light, just makes Demi-Veam on Digivolve. And then they golden armor energized. Yeah, yeah. And they Digivolve to Magnemon. It's golden flame drumon. Golden holy flame drumon. He's cool. He's also a royal knight. That's not relevant here, but it is a thing. It's the smallest royal knight. It's not a thing in the series yet. But yeah, that's like three seasons ahead. In this one, Magnemon's just glowy dude, here to save the day, we assume. But it just kind of cuts off the episode ends, just like that. I will say, though, I think it would have been interesting, instead of, I guess, it being Vmon that is Magnemon, it would have been kind of cool if Wormmon evolved, just narratively, because it would have been like, oh, Wormmon went through all this trouble to save Ken, and, and now Wormmon can save Ken. 
It would have been kind of cool. It kind of would have made sense, though, because the bond between them right now just is non-existent. But apart from that, it would be cool, just because I like Kongumon. It's like a, a golden beetle with lots of fox. Oh, that one, yeah. He's been an agent of God on Earth since ancient times. It's a beetle. Yeah, it's just a golden beetle, which wouldn't be as cool as Magnemon. Oh, that's fair. Like, it's not cool enough. I just wanted a Wormon to get into armor evolution. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> also, that Digiag had the symbol, or well, the crest of, was it kindness display on it? Or was that a different symbol? It has miracles. That was the crest of miracles. It didn't look like it when it flashed it up. Kindness is the pink egg that looks like a flower. Yeah, but the crest that flashed on the Digiag was the crest of kindness. It wasn't the crest of miracles, even though that's not the Digiag of kindness. Because the Digiag of kindness is just a pink flower. <laughs> I see what you mean now. I mean, I'm going to look that up now. So he picks up the Digiag of Miracles, which flashed the Crest of Kindness. Oh, it does. What the heck? That's weird. Either the writers didn't care, or it's suggesting some link between that Digiag and Ken, because we find out Ken has a Crest of Kindness, which we'll question later <laughs> when he gets a Crest of Kindness or whatever. That's a thing. Yeah, that is where the episode ended. Magnamon's there, and we're done. Cliffhanger, what's going to happen next? You have to wait till next episode to see him actually do anything. I'm going to assume that Ken's going to be defeated in one way or another. Sorry, the Digimon Emperor. They call him Ken too, so it's fine. Who's Ken too? You're reaching for the low-hanging joke freight, like I do. It is almost ten past ten, so I'm getting tired. So, is anything else we want to mention before the final questions? No, that's it. I do want to point out that I think Izzy updated the email so it doesn't use Comic Sans anymore. So, well done, Izzy. Aw, no more Comic Sans. You don't want Comic Sans. Why not? It's sensational. Wow. That's all I'm giving that. That's fair. The only other bit is just the, the bit of padding in the middle when they're just wandering around the base a bit and the back of turn up and they use stock footage attacks a lot. It felt like another short episode as a result. It felt like they could have had more happen in this episode because not a lot happens. It feels like they've split what could probably be two or maybe three into four episodes. They could have just been condensed more is what you're saying. It could have been more tightly packed. Yeah. Kind of like Chimera Mom's design. Scrap this part and this part and this part and we'll just smash it together. Make it a vaguely dragon shape. And then just make it 25 times bigger than everything else in the room. Yes. But yeah, that's all I wanted to mention from my notes. So, who was your standout character? Ken, for his moment of clarity. He kind of shows sympathy towards the baby Digimon. I think that that's, that's interesting. It's an interesting little character moment. It definitely was, like, a driving force in the episode. The other driving force, I would say, and my standout character, is Davis. Because I think he did a pretty solid job as leader in this one. Just rallying the troops and going ahead when with everyone else is kind of beaten down and bruised. Took the good re leader role and actually did a good job. We assume. We don't know how well Magnum Hunt's going to do. I mean, he found a an ancient golden digi-egg, so he's doing pretty good, I think. And he he's able to use it. Technically, Ken found it first, and then harnessed it to power a massive spaceship. Yeah, but Davis was trying to stop the ship, and Davis stopped the ship. And not only that, but he found a new weapon. And he also recruited the villain's partner, Digimon. So that was good. So what was your favorite thing? Well, I guess because I made Ken my standout, I'll make my favorite thing just Wormon's loyalty to Ken, which is adorable and sweet. There's probably better things like Davis actually doing a good job being a leader, but I just love Wormon, so dang it, Wormon's going to be my favorite thing. I will mention that Davis did a good job today. Though. Pat on the back for Davis. Pat on the back for Davis, being actually good. I initially wrote down Wormon, but thinking about it, my favorite thing is probably just Chimeramon and how he destroys everything until he gets bored and flies away. It's like, you know what? I don't, I don't like this. I don't like this whole being ordered around thing, so I'm just going to go. That's basically it. He's just stopped obeying orders because Ken was losing it. So he went his own way. And he's still just a really cool design for a Digimon. It's made of everything else. Yeah, it's an interesting idea. And his attack is just firing a laser, which is cool. So, next one. Was this filler or not filler? Uh, not filler. Correct. There's plot happening, and also there was even a Digi-Egg, so lots of plot. Everything's going on. New Digi-Egg, new Digivolution, plot twists and turns and character growth and moments. Plot twist. Davis is doing a good job. This is unheard of. It is. Davis being good. It's unheard of. Has Davis finally decided to get good? Maybe. We'll see. 
find out, won't we? And overall thoughts wise, it was just a solid episode. I enjoyed it. It was a good episode, but also, like we mentioned before, it probably could have been more eventful than it was because there wasn't really a whole lot that was going on. It took them forever to get on the base, and then they kind of just fought Chimera on for a little bit, and then they just got the egg. Like they could have probably packed a little more in there. I don't know, but it was it was still a good episode. It had a lot of downtime, but the rest of it with Ken and Chimeraban and all that was cool. And I'm looking forward to the next episode because I, I can't remember most of Zero Two and what happens. I'm hoping something good will happen with Ken. And we finally got like a plot thread going, which is even better. This is all built up to this. And it's like 20 episodes in, we're reaching a, a climax to this arc. So it's good. After all that filler, we finally got a proper, proper story arc going on. And I'm assuming, like, the next one or the one after will be the finale of this arc, which will be cool. I forget how long this goes on for. Like, obviously, I remember bits like, Ken joins the team. Woo! Spoilers. But when and how does he transition from the Emperor to this new Ken? When is Ken a candidate for the team? <sighs> okay. I think that's enough Digimon discussion. Shall we move on to that other one? I think it's called Pokemon. Yeah, it was about like a plant or something. No, that was last week. Oh, was it? Uh... Oh, wait, no. That was this week as well. Just a different plant. Next up is Chikorita's Big Upset. Pokemon don't show! I've not been listening to the opening song before the episodes like I used to. Oh, yeah. I listen to it every time because I'm a dork. I should do. Because like the second theme's still good. It's not as good as the first one, in my opinion, but I still like it. I should listen to it next time. But this one jumps straight in, and for once, they're not just walking on a path somewhere. They're actually mid-battle. There's stuff happening. On the screen! (laughs) It's the magic of television. It's actual action! Ash has his Chikorita out, battling a Raticate. It's kind of a fair fight. Chikorita's doing pretty well. Sort of getting one down by the Raticate, and Ash decides to try and return Chikorita. And swap them for Pikachu. Chikorita does not approve and just repeatedly dodges the red laser from the Pokeball and refuses to return. I can understand where Chikorita is coming from. If I was losing to Eradicate, I'd probably be pretty upset too. It's like, you think I can't take a giant rat? What's wrong with you? That whole intro happens, things aren't going very well, and they take Chikorita to the Pokemon Center because they're strappy. And Ash has a, a brief conversation with Professor Oak, who we've not seen in some time, trying to get advice. Professor Oak reminds us of the GS ball. Yeah, that's a thing. Yeah, and Ash just says something about, oh no, we'd never forget about that, that thing that never comes up in the episodes ever. We probably wouldn't forget about the thing that we always forget about. It came up in like a Quagsar episode a while back, and I don't know if it's been mentioned since. So it's a reminder to the audience of like, yeah, this is still a thing. I've heard it has Celebi in, but I don't know if that's true in the anime. That's the theory, but uh, I think the plot of the GS ball never gets like used. It's just there, and then it's not. It's like, yeah, that was a thing that we forgot about. I never forget about the GS ball. Yeah, so they actually do forget about it. <laughs> Whoops. Oops. Oh, well. But the conversation's worthwhile, because we get some screen time of the best ship in Pokemon, which is Muck and Oak. Things are a bit of muck in the lab. What would you call a ship of Professor Oak and Muck? You could have, I guess, Moak. Yeah, I'm a Moak shipper. I'm a Moak shipper. Yeah, it's the best ship. (laughs) Muck is best girl. Oh, yeah, definitely. You can see the love in Muck's eyes. Like, even Professor Oak seems to be enjoying it when Muck climbs on him. It's bizarre, and I love it. So, after this... And Professor Oaks reminded us of the GS ball existing. Ash still hasn't got a clue what to do with Chikorita. They bump into Therapist Joy. Yes, a nurse Joy that is just happens to be a therapist. A psychologist that does therapy, whatever you call it. Nurse Therapist Psychologist Joy, who's just Joy with glasses, looks a bit smarter. Yeah, has a bit of a different outfit, but that's about it. And she gets to work analysing Chikorita, because they can try and work out why she's misbehaving. Oh wait, before we get to that, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. So when uh, Nurse Joy is mentioning to Ash that she can do, you know, she's a psychologist, she does therapies and stuff like that. Ash thought therapy was a Pokemon. (laughs) Like, come on, Ash, you're ten, not five. Never heard of therapy before? Maybe he's just not had therapy before. Maybe he's a healthy child. Okay, maybe that's reasonable. There is another thing that comes up again, though, that's a little less reasonable. I'll give you the therapy one makes a little sense. A little sense. Because Ash was just dumb. I mean, Ash couldn't work out that Chikorita was jealous. 
even though us as viewers worked it out five episodes ago. And Nurse Joy worked it out, like, immediately, just by looking at her. I really would have loved it if Joy just went like, you don't need therapy. It's pretty obvious that Chikarud is just jealous. Or envious. Like, she has envy. This is the thing I was talking about, because Ash also thinks envy is a Pokemon. I don't think there's an excuse for that one. I feel like you would know what envy is. Like, come on. I suppose. But it's still a good joke. Just Ash is dumb. He doesn't know what words are. How do you not know words? Can you not word, Ash? Come on, Ash. You got a words good. Well, Ash does not words good. He also does not Pokemons too good. That too. So the the planned therapy for Chikorita is to leave her behind in the greenhouse because she's a grass Pokemon and she needs to be with grass or something. Yeah, so she's more relaxed in nature kind of thing. Yeah, something along those lines, which is kind of just like, well, they usually nap under trees, so <laughs> kind of makes no difference, really. They do something kind of interesting here where they put Chikorita in the Pokeball and in the greenhouse, which doesn't make sense to me. Like, because you would think, like, oh, you, you can let her, like, yeah, sleep by a tree or in the grass, you know, relax and enjoy the greenhouse. But no, they just set the Pokeball in the greenhouse, and they're just like, all right, that's good enough. I suppose it is. Just, like, get better. Stay in the nature. That you're always confined in. It's a weird one. But yeah, they just kind of leave her behind in the Pokeball and all go to sleep in the Pokemon Center, where they have accommodation for everyone. They have guest rooms for patients, right? I suppose that does make sense. They all go to sleep and Chikorita wakes up and leaves the greenhouse because the door was left wide open because Nurse Joy is so very responsible. It's really silly. Like, how could they forget that? It's it's odd. I feel like she probably did it on purpose. Just so she can go like, look, Chikorita wants attention. You can tell because they ran away to make you look for them. Yeah, but she seems surprised later. That's the only plot hole in that theory. It would be interesting if she did that to test Chikorita, though. Like, well, let's see if Chikorita tries to run off. But it isn't that. It's just kind of like, we left the door open. (laughs) Whoops. Chikorita just flees for it in the middle of the night, and Pikachu follows her. Because Pikachu's trying to stop Chikorita running off. And basically just get on Chikorita's good side. Because Chikorita's all grumpy. All the time, just grumpy around Pikachu. It's almost like she's jealous of Pikachu or something. It's almost like we didn't need a therapist for this. It's almost like you can work it out just by looking at the Pokemon and how it behaves. You don't need to be a professional therapist to work out what that Pokemon's feeling. It's like, weird, Chikorita always shoves Pikachu away when I give Pikachu attention. I wonder what that means. I can't figure out what that means. So... After this, Chikorita's off in the wild. By that I mean just on the streets of whatever this city was called. Did they even name this town or say? Nope. Nope. Chikorita's on the streets and just finds, like, a, I guess an abandoned warehouse or something to kip in. Except it's not abandoned because there's three fighting types. Except it's not three, it's four because there's a primate as well. I do think that this is a weird group of Pokemon. So it's a Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan, Machoke, and Primeape. Why isn't Hitmon top there? I guess Hitmon top's not street thug enough. You could have had Hitmon top and Tyrogue in there, and then you would have just had the whole Hitmon family. But Tyrogue's not in this. Neither is Hitmon top. I just, I just thought that was odd. I mean, they've not drawn either of those new Pokemon before. They've not had their own episodes yet, so they're not ready to be used as side Pokemon. I can see that. So until Tyrogue and Hitmon Top have their own episode, they won't just be turning up in the wild. I'd assume they're all Gen One, just Gen One fighting type Pokemon. Just there. Yep, because they've already been used. That makes sense. It bothers me that like all the Kanto Pokemon are just still here in Johto. <laughs> yeah, because Kanto and Johto are like linked and stuff. We'll see if it's the same in like the third series onwards, where they just have past Pokemon turning up still in the wild. Uh, not as much. I think that's when they start doing like the really isolated like everything's new kind of stuff. It's a whole new world with the same old Pokemon. So yeah, Chikorita's slumber is disturbed by the fighting type street thugs and she's having none of it. So she just beats them up and becomes the leader of the gang. They're just like, oh, you beat Primeape. I guess you're in charge now. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Just like she passed the test and now she's in charge, which is cool. 
I like that. She's not having none of that sass. So, the following morning, Ash and Co. wake up, find that Chikorita and Pikachu have run off. Nurse Joyce is kind of like, oh, I just want attention. Pikachu probably tried to stop her. Yada yada yada, let's go find them. With the usual tactic of, we'll walk around and shout out the names as loud as possible. Yeah, no actual strategist. Like, start yelling Chikorita over and over again. Pretty much. That's just how they find Pokemon, is yell out the name. Yeah, it's almost like the Pokemon ran away, and that's probably not going to work, because, you know, they ran away. So they go up with plan B. B is for Bulbasaur, because Bulbasaur now has a great sense of smell, which has never been mentioned before, to my knowledge. That's that's weird. We just randomly get expert tracker Bulbasaur. The only logic I can think of is maybe there's a weird plant 